Our third topic zooms in on a nation that is locked into the middle of everything, and that is Turkey. Turkey, which sits between Asia and Europe. Turkey, which sits between Russia and the Arab world. But more recently, a Turkey which is actually shifting somewhat between democracy and autocracy. Turkey has been a member of the NATO alliance for most of the time most of us have been alive. Given recent trends, however, there are questions being raised about that last fact, which we are framing as a resolution this way. Turkey is an asset to NATO. On that resolution, our first speaker will be Bernard Haeckel. Bernard Haeckel, on that resolution, Turkey is an asset to NATO. Are you yes or no? I'm a yes, absolutely. I mean, Turkey is a hugely important country. It's one of the most important countries in, in the Middle East, as was mentioned earlier, the others being Israel and Saudi Arabia. Turkey has an absolutely massive population, a very strong military, has been a stalwart ally of the West for many, many decades, and it is tragic to see it move away, uh, as it has done, uh, from the Western alliance. And, uh, and, and you have to keep in mind that this is also a period when the Russians are coming into, back into the Middle East, and there are uh, relations between the Turks and the Russians which are detrimental to Western interests, uh, purchasing of the S-400 uh, missiles, uh, and all kinds, of other, uh, all kinds of other deals. Could you take a minute, 20 seconds, I'll give you the added 20 seconds just to explain what that missile purchase is. So that, that's, a, that's a very high-end uh, Russian uh, a missile system that's uh, ground to air. It can shoot down virtually any plane that flies. Uh, in the air. And, and the significance and, is that it's and, Russian. And it's Russian, and it's also not interoperable with the equipment that already exists in Turkey, which is all Western. And so this is a, a very bad uh, development. I think that Turkey, one of the reasons that Turkey has moved in the direction that it has away from the, the West has to do with the politics of the Middle East, in particular the question of the Kurds and the cozying up uh, between the Americans and the Kurds uh, in the war against ISIS, and Brett here would know all about that. Um, and I think it's, it's crucial to, to, to look to Turkey and to tell them that, you know, this, que this question of the Kurds does not mean in any way a, d a diminution in the alliance or the support that the West, and specifically the United States, has to give to Turkey. So Turkey is fundamental, it has to remain in NATO, and I hope we, to God, that we, we, we keep it there. Thank you, Bernard Haeckel. <laughs> Michael Duran, the resolution goes to you. Turkey is an asset to NATO, yes or no? Yes, uh, emphatically yes. Um, uh, I agree with everything that, uh, that my colleague uh, uh, Bernard said. Um, and I want to tell you that there's a story that hasn't been told in the United States, which is about the way that we abandoned our ally, Turkey. I mean, I think people are very familiar with, this, with all of the story about how um, uh, Erdogan has turned away from the West. But um, uh, one of the problems with Erdogan is, uh, and, and I would say actually Turkey in general, this is a nation that does not have a public relations gene. Uh, because they have a very good story to tell in the United States, and they haven't told it. Um, we, went into, um, uh, we went into Syria through the YPG, which is the Syrian arm of the PKK. Those are the separatist uh, Kurds in Turkey who want to carve out a Kurdistan from Turkey. They're an extremist terrorist organization recognized by the United States as a, uh, as a terrorist organization. This is the equivalent of the United States going into, say, Jordan and building up Hamas, and when the Israelis say, you know, what you're doing there next, right next to, to our country, building up this organization that wants to tear my country apart is not good for us, we said, sit down and shut up. Uh, we told them, sit down and shut up. And when there was a coup attempt against Erdogan, orchestrated by Gulen, who sits in Pennsylvania, and Erdogan said, hey, can you uh, extradite that guy? We said, sit down and shut up. So uh, at a certain point, he said, you know what? They're actually anti-Turkey. Today, forget about Erdogan, 80% of Turks, according to opinion, opinion polls, regard the United States as a hostile power. Thank you, There's Michael a reason Durant. for that. Thank you. <laughs> the floor moves to Barbara Slavin. On the resolution, Turkey is an asset to NATO, are you yes or no? Unbelievably, I agree <laughs> with my colleagues here on this one. I'm changing um, my vote. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe for slightly uh, different reasons. I'll let Brett speak to the, the YPG and the Kurds and all of that. Um, I, just, I just think it's important to keep Turkey tethered to the West. 
Uh, it's, it's a very important, it's a very large country. Um, and yes, Erdogan has taken it in very uh, undemocratic directions, but we've seen a resurgence of Turkish democracy recently. There were municipal elections and all the major municipalities, including Istanbul, voted against the, uh, the government-supported candidates. So uh, there, are d there are now defections from the ruling AK party. Some of their most talented uh, uh, officials, former officials, are now going to start a new party. So I think the last thing we want to do is to move away from Turkey now when Erdogan finally is beginning to look uh, a little bit weaker. The other thing is the neighborhood Turkey is in. I mean, if we, if we push them out of NATO, that just pushes them even more into the laps of the Russians uh, and, and the Iranians, which is certainly not in, in our interest. Um, you know, NATO is not the EU. There have been countries with rather authoritarian regimes in NATO. Uh, Spain and Portugal, famously, at the beginning. So we should keep Turkey in, not out, and uh, let's be patient. Let's, let's have some faith in the Turkish people. Thank you, Barbara Slavin. <laughs> Brett McGurk, Turkey is an asset to NATO, yes or no? I'm going to say no. Thank not, you. I, Interesting. I am not saying we should kick Turkey out of NATO, but the question of the present tense, are they an asset to NATO? And what is NATO? It's a vital <laughs> transatlantic alliance aimed to protect the security and prosperity of its members. And on that standard, Turkey right now is not an asset to NATO. I'm going to look at the Trump administration's national, national security strategy. What do we care about? Great power competition, China and Russia, international terrorism, and Iran. On all three measures right now, Turkey is not an asset. On international terrorism, I have to look. I ran the ISIS campaign. 40,000 foreign fighters, jihadis from 110 countries around the world, all came into Syria to fight in that war, and they all came through Turkey. Yeah. The caliphate was on the border of Turkey. We worked with Turkey. I was in Turkey more than any other country to have them seal their border, and they would not do it. They said they couldn't do it, but the minute the Kurds took parts of the border, it's totally sealed with a wall. So let's just be honest about the record. It is not the fact that we went with the YPG and told, told Turkey to sit in a corner. That's just not factual. On Iran, Turkey was the biggest sanctions buster backdoor of any country around the world to Iran. Almost $100 billion in a sanctions busting scheme went through Turkey by their own state-owned bank, the general manager of whom was prosecuted here in the Southern District of New York. And Erdogan accused that judge and the entire our judicial system of being run by the cleric in Gulan in Pennsylvania, which is ridiculous. On Russia, Turkey is buying, the only NATO member buying sophisticated military hardware from Russia. That is a serious problem. NATO is an alliance Brett formed McGurk, against sorry, Russia. Your time is up. So the answer I think you're going to have no. a lot of chance to talk in the next section. <laughs> Turkey is an asset to NATO. Rule Mark Eric, are you yes or no? I think I detected a few Greeks in the audience. <laughs> but um, we need your uh, participation. Uh, can, is there any possibility I can do uh, you yes no. or no and just do waffle? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh. Uh, I mean, it's, I have. Uh, uh, can you tell the listening audience what your choice? I, I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm very, to I'm very torn here. Uh, one person. Well, let me, for the record, say that you have put up the flag. No. No, but I, I wrote waffle. Waffle. So, uh, which is what I want to do. Um, I mean, I, 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 when I lived in Turkey for a number of years, I'm very fond of the Turks, and Istanbul is the greatest city on earth. Um, you know, I, I, I think that Turkey in and of itself remains a potential asset uh, to NATO. It, uh, and I agree uh, uh, with Barbara, I think it should remain, uh, to the extent that we can, tethered uh, to the United States and to the West. I think it's an investment that is well worth our while, and the great experiment of Turkey is by far, it's not over yet. With that said, I, I don't have any doubts that Erdogan uh, is a fairly determined Islamist. I am surprised that Michael actually didn't bring up this issue. I think he has a, he has a desire and a dream to take Turkey in a different direction, uh, certainly not in an Ataturkist direction, a Kamalist direction. Uh, that cannot be possibly be good for the United States. Militarily, obviously, Turkey can no longer be brought in with the secrets of NATO. Uh, now, NATO is a very structured organization. Some people in NATO get to see more than others. Uh, Turkey is going to be at the very bottom of that list now. Uh, it has deeply compromised the F-35 program, the new 
uh, self a fighter program, bomber program, it's an all-purpose aircraft. Uh, you cannot possibly allow that thing to be de deployed in Turkey now. I don't know what they've done with okay. some of the intelligence agreements that we have with Turkey. Yeah. That I, I have to stop record. you because uh, your time is up. I'm stopped now. <laughs> okay, thank I you waffled. very much. Thank you, that concludes the opening round of our third resolution. And um, on the resolution, Turkey is an asset to NATO, we have three yeses, we have a very, very firm no, and we have a waffle uh, <laughs> uh, disguised as a no. Um, so so uh, I think, give, being the firm no, Brett, you're gonna have a lot of time talking back to, uh, to your opponents. But right. uh, what, I, what I think I heard was a sort of constant theme which uh, unites you all, actually, is that Turkey has the potential to be a fantastic uh, NATO partner, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not, and it would be better if it were, uh, depending on conditions. What I also heard was a little bit of whose fault is it that this thing is up in the air right now? And uh, Mike Duran, I think uh, you were saying that Turkey's been treated badly, and that um, the, the notion being that could be corrected, therefore. So, Brett, could you take that thought on that, uh, I think Michael's argument that uh, the reason Turkey, in your view, is not uh, an asset right now has a lot to do with our treatment of Turkey and that that could be corrected. So first, I'm fairly confident if you look at any public opinion poll in Turkey almost any year, uh, Americans are very unpopular. Um, before we ever heard of this group, the YPG in Northeast Syria, which I can talk to, but I don't want that to dominate the whole debate, but before we ever heard of the YPG, and we decided to go to war against ISIS because ISIS was committing genocide and it was controlling 11, 8 million people across Iraq and Syria, you all know about ISIS. We went to Turkey and said, hey, let's fight this together. We want to fly to Vinterlik Air Base to target uh, ISIS. We need you to do some things on the border, et cetera, et cetera. And frankly, I have to be honest, they did nothing. They would not let us fly out of Vinterlik Air Base. They would not let us do anything. It was incredibly frustrating. We tried to do everything we possibly could with the Syrian opposition working out of Turkey. And too many times, they were completely interwoven with extremist groups tied to Al Qaeda that we could not work with. And Turkey, frankly, did not do much to help at all. Mm. The YPG was a group that was surrounded by ISIS. For, for those who don't know the terminology. The YPG what? is uh, a Syrian Kurdish group in northeast Syria. They were about to be slaughtered with a m bunch of Kurdish civilians at a little it, town on the border the of Turkey. Uh, they're affiliated with- Is it the PKK? We'll, we'll come back to that, Michael. Have, has there, here's a key question. Has there ever been an attack from Syria into Turkey from this group? The answer is no. The answer is no. And Frank, and who made the decision, who made the decision to arm the YPG? It was actually President Trump, not President Obama. So there's a lot of history here that I want to make sure that we get absolutely right. But when ISIS was about to take this Kurdish town on the border uh, with Turkey, we made the decision to do what we could to help save this town. And frankly, at the time, Turkey was working with the YPG. They did an operation into, into Turkey, working co in cooperative with the, with the YPG. I was in Ankara to manage that operation, and it was a big success. And as, as soon as the Kurds started taking these towns away from ISIS on the border, Turkey totally sealed their border. We said, why didn't you seal the border when ISIS was there? And flatbed trucks were coming across the border with ammonium nitrate and weapons and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of history here, but the argument that Turkey suddenly turned a switch because we worked with the YPG uh, is just simply not true. Barbara, could you, do, could you do us the favor of just a little education and, and take four sentences to explain to people who may not be completely familiar with the Turkish-Kurdish relationship, what that's about? Because that's, <laughs> that's critical in the, the conversation. Yeah, it, it is, and, and you know, and, and Brett may know this better, but there was actually a, a peace process. There are many, many Kurds in Turkey. Ethnic Kurds make up, what, 30% of the population, probably. Okay, so just um, very basically, the Kurds are an ethnic the, the group? Kur the Kurds are the world's largest ethnic group without their own country. There are Kurds in Iran, there are Kurds in Iraq, there are Kurds in Syria, there are Kurds in Turkey. They are the largest ethnic minority in Turkey. And there have been uh, clashes, there have been guerrilla groups, there have been, there's been terrorism. There was a peace process though. One of the reasons Erdogan was initially so popular uh, was because he actually agreed to, to peace with the Kurds and, uh, and then this peace agreement fell apart and I'm still not really clear on whose fault that is. I think. I think that Erdogan got paranoid. He saw that Kurds were becoming more prominent uh, in Syria. He got worried, and, and there were incidents. Who started it, Brett? Who, who, who attacked whom first? But there were, there were incidents that the ceasefire broke, 
and then uh, and then Erdogan got very very okay. upset right. about U.S. working I, I, with I the Kurdish groups against in, ISIS. I don't want to go too deeply into the background, but I also want to add the fact, and Brett has alluded to it, that the Kurds have been our allies in against ISIS. They've been very some effective. of them have, and it has been very critical. But Bernard Haeckel, I want to take to you um, Brett's point that at critical moments the Turks have not acted like allies. They haven't done the things allies do at, as requested, and that's a pretty serious charge and a pretty good definition of a bad ally. So can you take that response on? Well, look, I mean, uh, Turkey is an independent country, and for instance, the first instance where they didn't do what the United States wanted them to do was to join in uh, in 2003 in the, in, the, in the war against Iraq. They, for, they, they f forbade the United States from using Turkey as a launching uh, pad uh, for the Iraqi invasion. And that proved very costly for the United States because we had to f f go get around Turkey. So, you know, the Turks have their own kind of independent and autonomous policy, and they don't always see eye to eye with us. Uh, on, on ISIS, they probably thought that the Kurds were more dangerous than, than, uh, than the Islamic State. That comes as a real shock to us as Americans. Right. But you know they have but twenty percent. But the fact the that they're dancing with Russia and they're dancing with China right now, who are our most existentially concerning uh, rivals out there, does that not seem non-alliance-like? Yes, but I think one of the reasons they're doing that is because they don't feel that we have their back. Michael Duran. Uh, back in 2015, the uh, the Turks shot down a, a Russian airplane. And we uh, and they looked to NATO to support them against the, uh, against the Russians, and we treated it like a bilateral problem. We said we hope that you Turks and you Russians sort out this problem. We didn't treat it. Russia was probing all along the NATO air airspace from the from the uh, from the Baltics all the way down to the Balkans, even into even into British airspace. The Russians were probing. We could have used this as an example to say that this is un that this is unacceptable. The Turks shot down a Russian over Turkish airspace at the time. So um, we that sent a very clear signal. It was I'm, I'm not just talking about the one incident. I'm talking about the entire Syria conflict. Mm -hmm. We are the only country in the world that went in and said. We, the, the overwhelming priority, the, the, the number one priority of the United States is to destroy ISIS. Everyone else in the region had a very simple and logical and important question, and that is, what order is going to replace the order that is in, that is in Syria Let now? Let me bring in Brad. Who's going to fill this vacuum? Can I, just one more sentence? One sentence. We never went to the Turks and said, let's work together to build an order, because we didn't like their answer. Hmm. Brett? I just... Michael and I say this with all due respect, but um, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Love and affection. But the problem with Michael's, I'm just going to back the lens up. This is a, a debate about the Middle East. The problem with his formula for the Middle East is he mentions Israel, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. Israel and Saudi Arabia, if they have really won, I mean, Iran is obviously enemy number one, enemy number one and a half is Erdogan. Hmm. Saudi Arabia and Turkey are fighting proxy wars and supporting different groups all throughout the region. Yeah. This is a serious, uh, serious uh, problem. But the truth is that when it came to ISIS, we had to fight ISIS. I mean, I, what, what is the formula here? There was no Syrian opposition group that we could work with uh, that could be effective. We invested hundreds of millions of dollars through the Department of Defense in certain groups, and we, when we inserted them into Syria, they gave half their equipment to Al-Qaeda, and they ended up going backwards when they started military operations. This is a very desperate situation. Uh, but we did all we possibly could with Turkey. I was in Turkey, again, more than any other country in the entire coalition that we built. Um, but it's not just Northeast Syria. Turkey's threatening to come in Northeast Syria to attack the Kurds, which will put American lives at risk. That's a serious problem. Erdogan is also saying, at the same time, he wants to push the Greeks into the sea because he has claims uh, in, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. This is, this is a problem throughout the region right now. Erdogan is a serious, destabilizing actor. Let me bring in Ruel Mark Eric. Have you de-waffled on this? Or? I'm still sort of waffling. Uh, I mean, I would say that, I mean, it's a byproduct, once again, of the American retreat from the region. If uh, President Obama or President Trump had been willing to insert, say, three, 4,000 troops into Syria, I think the situation could have been different. We were not, so we played on a fault line in the Turkish uh, psychology. That's inevitable. I mean, Turkey actually does view itself as a much more fragile state than I think people in the West realize. And the primary fault line is a Kurdish one. Now, I might dissent a little bit on the way uh, Michael has described the YPG. 
uh, in, in Syria. But I, I think you have to accept the way the, the Turks look at it, and you can understand why they got deeply nervous. And I, I don't think, and also when the Turks look at the United States, as does everyone in the region now, they're saying, is the United States really going to be there? I mean, NATO becomes a, a, a secondary issue for Turkey. Uh, if the United States is going to actually retreat from the Middle East, uh, retreating from the Middle East, I think they read that also as retreating from NATO. Look, or, look, we, NATO, what is NATO for? NATO is to counter Russia. The Iranians and the Russians moved into Iran and moved into Syria. The, the Iranians provided the ground troops, the Russians provided the air cover, and the Turks said, we don't like that. And the Obama administration said, sit down and shut up. One of, the reasons we, one of the reasons we picked the YPG to fight ISIS is because the YPG has a history of good relations with Russia and Iran. It was, we knew that the, it's not that, it's not that they, were gonna, they weren't gonna go deliver their weapons to Al Qaeda and to, uh, and to other jihadi groups. It was because they, would not, they promised us they wouldn't fight the Iranians and Assad because not fighting was Iranians really and Assad decision. was part of the, was part, not fighting them was part of the JCPOA may just, conception. May I That's just not, say this is all, <laughs> this all sounds very complicated. Yes. It's very, no, it's Did, very I mean, simple. You really it's very could simple. Have overthrown it's very simple. Obama wanted to cut a deal with Iran. I want to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Because Bernard hasn't had a, a moment. I just a moment. also, I mean, just to Bernard, back up. back to you, Brett. I think to back up a little bit too, in addition to Turkey being a fragile state with 20% of its population being Kurdish, so there's always a fear of secession. The other thing about the Turks is that they were always treated very badly by the Europeans. They wanted into the European Union. They were always treated like these dirty Muslims who didn't fit in and weren't really European. And then the Americans come and often treated them also as a kind of spare tire that can only be brought out and used whenever necessary. And I think that that you know, hurt their hurt their ego and hurt their sense of pride and honor. And we're seeing the consequences of this in the behavior of Erdogan. Brett, do you want so to say I agree, I agree with something Michael said earlier very much. Our foreign policy is becoming too partisan. Trump this, Obama that. I totally agree with you. And yet when I hear you speak, it's all about the Obama administration. <laughs> this goes back a long time. Trump has been in office now almost three years. The S-400s were purchased on Trump's watch. It is Trump that said, we're getting out of Syria. You're all on your own, which totally spooked the Turks. So it's not all about Obama. It's not all about Trump either. It's about some pretty serious dynamics that are going on right now in Turkey under the leadership of President Erdogan that are leading that country in a bad direction. There's a romanticism about Turkey in Washington because the Turkey of how it used to be. That Turkey's not there right now. I think we want to try to get it back. That requires some serious engagement, but also requires telling the truth when they're doing things that are totally against the interests of the United States and NATO. Mm -hmm. Barbara Slavin. Yeah, I just, you know, Michael, with all due respect, you have this fantasy In that- love? <laughs> with- <laughs> Wait, hold on. With, with We're on the same side. We are on the same side, <laughs> but, but, but you have this fantasy that somehow more robust American intervention would have gotten rid of Assad. I mean, look at, you know- look I don't at, know, the Russians thought the other way around, and it seems to have worked. Look what, happened in, look what happened in Iraq. Look what happened to us in Iraq. Look what happened in Libya. You know, then comes Syria. I, I think that it's a fantasy that, uh, that we could have overthrown Assad. And even if we had, the likely result would have been an ISIS-led state, or certainly a, a, a Sunni fundamentalist-led state. So Assad is a son of a bitch. He's horrible. But that doesn't mean that we could have somehow gone in there and changed the trajectory. And that concerns. concludes debate on our third resolution. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.